in the 30 years that I've been at UCLA, most recently as anthropology department chair, I've been honored to work with many remarkable colleagues, phenomenal students, and distinguished alumni. One of the most satisfying aspects of my job as department chair has been connecting with alumni who have changed the world in important and unexpected ways. Today's keynote speaker is an excellent example. Professor Susan Smalley earned her undergraduate degree in anthropology at the University of Michigan and her master's and doctorate in biological anthropology right here at UCLA, specializing in population, population and behavior genetics. She continued her UCLA career with postdoctoral work in medical genetics and childhood psychopathology. She then joined the faculty of the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences in our medical school and spent decades studying the genetics of childhood onset behavioral disorders such as autism and attention to deficit hyperactivity disorder, better known as ADHD. <laughs> Which sign? Today she is a professor emerita in the Jane and Terry Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. When Sue found herself going through a life-changing medical odyssey, she discovered the value of intuition as a means of acquiring knowledge. And in 2004, to creating UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center, also known as MARC, to bring practices of mindfulness and meditation to broader communities. Some of you may have already experienced the benefits of MARC, which offers free daily drop-in meditations to the UCLA community and the public at large. Today, Dr. Smalley also writes, lectures, and works philanthrop philanthropically to promote a kinder and more equitable society. For example, she serves on the boards of Equality Now, an international organization dedicated to gender equality, and Gordon and Seymour Brown's High Panel on Education, which seeks to globally promote educational opportunities for all. Sue is also dedicated to the health and well-being of her family, including her husband, Kevin Wall, and her three adult children, Patrick, Tim, Kelly, and their partners, all of whom are here today. So please help me give a warm and proud welcome to one of our own, Professor Susan Smalley, UCLA anthropologist, scientist, writer, philanthropist, and our 2013 Department of Anthropology commencement speaker. Well, thank you so much for asking me to talk to you today. Dean Durante, Professor Browner, faculty, parents, friends, and graduates of 2013. Woo! Last week I was in London when I visited an art gallery that had a giant wooden fishing boat in the window. The vessel was created by an Indian artist and it measured 65 feet in length. It was completely crammed with things, tea kettles, pots and pans, an old television, chairs, beds, window frames, suitcase, bicycle blankets, dishes, and fishing nets. Everything one fisherman might collect over the course of a single lifetime. The title of the piece was, What Does the Vessel Contain That the River Does Not? They were words spoken by the 13th century Persian poet Rumi. Well, I thought about that boat and the saying for several days, and I realized it was actually the central thesis of the commencement speech I had written for you today. And that is that we are all part of a river of shared humanity, and yet we each collect and fill our own boats with unique life experiences. We are each a microcosm of that whole. Each of you are adding a new object to your individual boat today, a degree in anthropology. But I asked myself when I was writing this speech, and so I ask you now, why the heck anthropology? I sort of fell into it. It was really a default choice. I had taken so many anthro classes in my first two years of college, I figured I might as well major in it. 
It was as good as any to get me into law school and my then ambition to be a judge. Yet after graduation, while studying for the LSAT, anthropology just seemed so much more interesting to me than the prep course material. I had loved studying gorillas, had even learned to speak some Navajo, had discovered the healing power of plants in ethnobotany. And I soon found myself in graduate school here, specializing in biological anthropology, particularly the evolution of human behavior. You know that science actually shows we have something called a default brain state, and it's what our brain does when it's not doing, not planning, organizing, or deliberately thinking. This default brain state is associated with our being, not our doing nature. And it's thought to play an important role in understanding oneself. So I would say my being side led me to anthropology, and my doing side helped me complete the PhD. After graduate school, as you heard, I moved across campus to the Department of Psychiatry. Well, that didn't really fit into what most people think of as anthropology, but it's exactly why anthro is such a unique field. It is the study of humankind. It's why you'll find anthropologists in all sorts of careers. It prepares you to be an investigator of what it is to be human, whether you do that through art, psychology, law, medicine, science, film, or business. For me, I worked as a behavior geneticist trying to understand who we are as human beings by finding genes and how they influence the brain, how they interact with the environment, and how they shape what we think, feel, and do. My work began, as you heard, with autism, right out of graduate school, where I spent many years meeting families with two or more children with autism and listening to the experiences of what it's like to live with that condition. I came to know many people with autism and saw them well beyond a diagnosis. But I also saw how psychiatric diagnoses, like race, religion, gender, and physical differences, can be stigmatizing and a focus of discrimination. From autism, I shifted to att attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, where there was very little research on genes for this very common and highly heritable condition. I also happened to live in a family with a lot of ADHD, so I was really curious and highly motivated. As we searched for risk genes, I became more interested in the strengths of those with ADHD, not just their difficulties. The work reminded me again of what I had learned in anthropology, to value diversity, whether that is physical, behavioral, or cultural in origin. About 10 years ago, I was growing increasingly frustrated with a medical model of psychiatry, one focused primarily on disorder or disability, what someone cannot do, instead of what they can do. When I had my own brush with illness, a tiny freckle, an early stage melanoma, one of the deadliest forms of skin cancer, gave me a scare and a glimpse at my own mortality. It was a tipping point for me as a scientist as well. I began to let go of a belief that science is the only valuable means of knowing, and I began to explore alternatives, particularly first-person methods of investigation like meditation, yoga, tai chi, and other practices I previously had rejected as from a very skeptical scientific slant. These practices cultivate a mental state of being present with experiences as they happen, with open curiosity as opposed to judgment or criticism, a mental state called by many mindfulness. In a short period of intense study, I learned how powerful mindfulness can be to better know oneself and find meaning in life. Then I discovered a growing body of science around mindfulness, showing that it is an antidote to stress, to feeling out of balance and overwhelmed, and that it impacts the immune response, brain structure and function, even gene expression, and it enhances overall health and well-being. 
It's why I spent the last decade of my life at UCLA bringing mindfulness to the hospital, the campus, and the LA community at large. And now why scientists all around the world are working to understand how and why it can be so beneficial. Mindfulness brings you to the present moment, that being state of mind, in contrast to the doing state you use every day to get things done. These two kinds of minds have been described throughout human history by many different names. Einstein called the intuitive mind, he, he called them the intuitive mind and the rational mind when he said the intuitive mind is a sacred gift, the rational mind a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. So why anthropology? I think we all share characteristics that draw us to this field. They are the characteristics of our being, what Einstein called that intuitive mind. They are the three C's, creativity, connectedness, and compassion. We are creative, and that's why we end up in anthropology. It's the ultimate field for curious people who want to know more, the explorers, the seekers, the adventurers. And curiosity leads you to the edge of knowledge, to the place where unknowing and knowing meet. It's the border area where new things arise, new thoughts, knowledge, discoveries, new products. It's at that edge that creativity occurs. We see connectedness, and it draws us to anthropology, a field that is all about connections, how we connect to our distant ancestors via evolution, archaeology, and primatology, how we connect to the planet, animals, and other people through music, art, religion, and ritual, and how we connect to one another via language. We think long-term, not short-term, we see patterns repeating themselves across time. We ask questions that span millions of years. We see that the past and the present and the future are tightly interdependent. Because we see this connectedness, we feel we're part of a larger whole, humanity, evolution, or a process of change. And in that view, we are compassionate. For why would you hurt a part of yourself? Feeling part of shared humanity is the key to empathy and open-mindedness because with it emerges a greater interest in understanding how others think, feel, and act. Graduates of 2013, as you leave UCLA today, remember you carry these qualities with you, qualities we want in the citizens of the 21st century, the leaders and participants in a world that's vastly connected requiring creativity and compassion to unite us as global citizens, to go beyond boundaries of race, gender, religion, or nationality, and to solve global problems. As you collect your own life experiences beyond UCLA, remember as each of you evolve, so does our shared human nature, the river as Rumi described it. So do many things have many life experiences, and remember to enrich humanity as you do so, to make the world a kinder place now and for future generations many, many years ahead. No doubt you will experience times where you don't know what you want to do, perhaps right now or at other times in the future. Learning to be present with uncertainty is part of being kind to yourself. And kindness is an outward expression of compassion, one of the three C's of the anthropologist. Remember, you're as important as everyone else, so be kind to yourself as well as others. Henry James said there are three important things in life. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. The third is to be kind. As you go through life, there will be periods of certainty followed by uncertainty, and back again. But it's in the times of uncertainty that you really explore and grow in understanding who you are and who we are as human beings. And that is the definition of anthropology. So that is why anthropology. 
I congratulate you all for joining me on this journey. Thank you.